Alexander Cole is one of the most innovative sculptors of this century. He redefined sculpture with wire and motion and imagination. His wire sculptures drew lines in space. His mobiles brought motion to sculpture. His monumental stabils introduced unconventional form and materials into public space. This year, the National Gallery of Art in Washington celebrates the centennial of his birth. The exhibit is the first major retrospective of Calder's work since his death in 1976. With us this evening to talk about it, the exhibit's curator, Marla Prather, also Roger Sherman, director and producer of the American Masters Special, Alexander Calder, and Alexander Rohr, grandson of Sandy Calder. He collaborated on the exhibition and is the author of Calder Sculpture. I am pleased to have all of them here. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you. And for you and for you, Thank all you. of you. Uh, tell me about Alexander Calder, your namesake. Well, actually, I'm named after my great-grandfather, right. Alexander Sterling Calder. But uh, we're, both, we're both called Sandy. Right. Yeah. Um, he, he was my grandfather. Everybody has a grandfather, and uh, he was just my grandfather. He wasn't some larger-than-life character. Um, uh, he wasn't somebody I revered in that way. Um, I, he was my grandfather. I spent time with him in the studio, watched him work. He showed me how to use tools and uh, what he was about, and I always made stuff in the studio, and he was always correcting how I held a hammer or something like that for more efficiency. And, um, like that. I'd, I'd go to his openings and go to his shows, and his work was always around me. It wasn't something rarefied, something distant. It's always in the house, it's, uh, like furniture. And what did he think his contribution was? Oh, he never discussed that. He never no. talked about his contribution. Well, curators do. <laughs> what was his contribution, Marla? What was it that we can say best about him? Well, first of all, we use the word mobile yeah. uh, every day, and I think we forget that it was a term virtually invented for Calder sculptures that move. Yeah. So it's kind of entered the vernacular in this way, and he gave us an entirely new species of sculpture, the mobile. I mean, no one has really made them since. He made an entirely new form of sculpture that really defied all the rules. What was it to bring together this retrospective? I mean, how difficult? How'd you go about it? What, how hard was it? Well, I think the big complication with Calder is the enormity of the body of work. Because as Sandy has figured out by working on the catalog raisonne of the entire body, um, Calder made around 16,000 objects. Now that includes every sketch, every lithograph, and so forth. But still, when you whittle it down to sculpture, there are thousands of objects to deal with. So that was the challenge, was whittling it down and down and down, because he made so much great work that I think the first time we had a rough cut of the show, yeah. it was around 600 objects, and the museum told me they wouldn't fit. So. <laughs> Not that much space here for no. you. Uh, what's the organizing principle? Well, the works really evolve chronologically through the exhibition, but our sense was that in the latter part of the career, once Calder became more of a public sculptor, beginning in the late 1950s, the works obviously become too big to include in galleries, per se. And so the larger works are placed outside the museum, throughout the public spaces of the museum. I'm going to go to the end because most people have seen this and most people have thought about this. Just take a look at this. Tell me about this. This is at the end rather than the beginning. Well, that is a standing mobile that is outside the East Building from 1963 called Southern Cross. And uh, it was a special challenge to install that object. It took a full day. And then we discovered once we placed it on 4th Street um, at the corner, that uh, it was a kind of wind tunnel and the thing was spinning around out of control <laughs> and so we had to slow it down with washers and so Spinning forth. out of control it, meaning what? It was, it was moving so fast yeah. that it was tangling up on itself <laughs> and each day when I would come into the museum it would be in some sad configuration and so now it is behaving properly. Yeah. Now why is this the first retrospective since he died in 76? We're now 23 years later. It takes that much time to get it together? There have been other shows. There was for example a show that toured Europe recently, was in Paris a couple of years ago. There's always a Calder show somewhere. Yeah, but like I think a Picasso show somewhere. It, there is always, as Sandy knows, he's constantly busy with Calder yeah. shows somewhere. But this is the first important American retrospective since the death. And it will be at the National Gallery for how long? Until July 12th. And then goes? To the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And if you go and get to see it, you get to see your film. Why do an American Masters about Alexander Calder? Besides that he invented an art form? Yeah, well that's, a, <laughs> well, that's just a small reason. Are there others? Well, I think he's the ideal subject for a film. The he, art form is? The mobile. Okay. He also invented wire sculpture, which right. 
a lot of people don't know. He also changed the face of public sculpture as we know it today and laid the groundwork for a whole generation and now maybe two generations of monumental artists. But his work is about movement, and so he's ideal in, in portraying. He's also a wonderful character. Uh, the foundation and the archive is extensive. There were 60-odd yeah. films. He's thousands and thousands of photographs. First found fame when he went to Paris? Yeah. Tension. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the late 20s. Tell, we're going to see the film of the circus that he would do. Tell us about it. Well, when he arrived in Paris in, in the fall of 26, he started making these little figures which would perform. They were kinetic, actually. And he made a series of performances which then evolved into a great, a great circus. And uh, he would perform it. I mean, it really was a distillation of, yeah. of the natural circus down to this, this performable size in, in his studio. But other great artists of his time would come. Well, all of, the, all of the artists in, in Paris at the time came. Yeah. And Mondrian came, and Miro came, and Leger came, and they all came to see this thing. I mean, it was How a would you like to be there? <laughs> yeah, that would have been great. Wouldn't it be great? Here, roll tape. Take a look at this. This is from Roger's film, uh, part of the American Masters series, on PBS, which will air... Next Wednesday, the 17th. Wednesday, the 17th of June. Roll tape. Still fascinated by the big top, Calder constructed dozens of animals, acrobats, and mechanical devices until he had an entire miniature circus. He would perform the whole thing himself in his apartment, charging around the room, blowing whistles, making animal sounds, operating a dozen contraptions at once, while his friends smoked and drank and laughed themselves silly. Before long, these uproarious evenings became the hot night out in Paris. Cocteau and Montrian came, Juan Miro, Fernand Léger, Man Ray, Jean Alp all came to Calder's Circus. He would go on performing it from time to time for decades to come. How many times have you seen him do that, Sandy? I never saw him perform you never saw the circus. Him, but you were there in the studio, but you never saw him do that? He stopped performing the circus in 1930 oh. when he became abstract. And then he would perform it to, you know, upon occasion to draw people to an exhibition or something, really more as, um, yeah. you know, as, as a stunt to get people there, to see the abstract work. When he, 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 was, a, you know, he was a figurative sculptor, right. and when he made the circus as this event, really as performance art, um, when he became abstract, he lost his interest in it. In fact, he used to have these wooden planks, these bleachers, for the studio for people to sit on um, when, they, when they came to watch the performance. And he cut those up as bases for abstract sculpture. So he, he shifted from this, you know, from performing and from figurative work to, to pure abstraction. His genius is from what he did with wire and what he did with motion. I mean, that we, and that's, that's part of what makes him so influential and lasting. But what was his genius? What, what was it that made him a great artist? Was well, it the hands, at the capacity? I mean, to be able to take that wire and to look at those figures, which we'll see. Well, I think that he did master every material that he touched. And um, we see it first with uh, wood carving. He was a marvelous yeah. wood carver. And he could then translate that into the abstract once after 1930. He became an abstract artist. And the same thing with wire. I mean, in the late 1920s, he's making these marvelous caricatures of Josephine e. Baker, Calvin Coolidge, right. and so forth. But then, after 1930, when there's this kind of uh, breakthrough to abstraction, he takes that same medium and translates it into an entirely new dimension. But always the material is mastered, I think, by Calder. He had a kind of facility with his hands as a draftsman, as a manipulator of wire, as a carver of wood. He even made bronze. Um, there are very few media that he didn't tackle, actually. And he never stopped pushing. I mean, you look at the wire sculptures, and they're all different. They're all, they really portray the people that they are of. And you look at the mobiles, and I've gotten to see not as many as these folks, but hundreds. And 
each one has something new and different and, and intriguing about it. Wonderful. Where did this fascination with motion come and this, this use of motion? Well, you, you can see it um, in, in, your very, in your first picture that you've got a duck. Right. He made it in 1909 when he was 11 years old, and it's kinetic. You tap the tail and it rocks on its belly. Wow. It's his first kinetic work that we've been able to document. But, and the circus is kinetic. I mean, everything has some sort of kinetic aspect. And he always wanted to work in multidimensional. Yeah. It seems that way. I mean, when he, when he committed to being an artist, he was a painter. He, he studied painting. He never studied sculpture. And then he blossomed. He, you know, his father was a sculptor. So it was natural for him to become a sculptor, I think. Was there a point which he made the transition because of something? Not that I'm yeah. aware of. Yeah. I mean, in Paris, he was painting and he was making sculpture. All right, in this clip, uh, you see the relationship between abstraction and motion over footage of some of the mobiles, and Marla's provides some of the voiceover in this sequence along with uh, the narrator. Roll tape. Einstein himself came to a Calder show, and he stood transfixed for 40 minutes through an entire movement cycle of a piece called a universe. Calder's first abstract sculptures, kinetic sculptures, were motorized sculptures. And I think he found them distracting. There is a great deal of repetition. They broke down, one had to repair them. He said at one point, better a good sculpture than a good motor. And one has to remember that the whole idea of chance was very much in the air in Paris. And he eventually came to desire chance and chance movements in the sculptures. With the joining of pure abstraction and random motion, Calder's art took flight. What shall I call these things? Calder asked his friend Marcel Duchamp. Duchamp replied, mobile, a French pun meaning both motion and motive. Until Alexander Calder invented it, the mobile had never existed. To Jean-Paul Sartre, the mobile embodied an absolute purity of abstraction. A mobile is a little private celebration, he wrote, an object defined by its movement and having no other existence. A mobile does not suggest anything. It captures genuine living movements and shapes them. Mobiles have no meaning. They make you think of nothing but themselves. They are, that is all. The mobiles, I didn't realize Duchamp was, gave him the name. Yeah. yeah. It, this was in the 1930s. If he had done nothing else, He's a great artist already. That's right. And our feeling about doing the show was that the great work of the 30s was a major focus, and we really have focused on the early contributions of Calder. But there are spectacular things from the 30s, many of which haven't been seen before. But you see in a clip like that how well Calder is served by cinema. Yeah, exactly. And that this is an art form that is temporal, that exists through time. and. Roger has actually given us some footage that we have right in the exhibition because we can't motorize many of these objects and so you can only see them on film and in many ways it adds a whole dimension to the show that you can't have with a physical object. One of the ironies is that the work is now so valuable that it's not permitted to move for fear that it will break or chip and um, I learned through watching old films of Calder that he wanted this these objects to fly in the wind and have people push them and shove them and and uh, so we were fortunate enough to get some people to allow us to do that. And stabiles are what? Which is what we'll see next. They're the stationary objects and Jean Arp, the artist, uh, came up with that that phrase. My grandfather didn't have any of these names for his own 
his own sculptures. He called them objects. Did he see it? He clearly saw it as art. Oh, absolutely. And understood that there was, that this was great. Understood that. I no, I can't because he didn't think that. about that. No, he just made things, and you enjoyed it or you didn't. As long as you gave him the opportunity to, you know, a little of your time to look at the thing, that's that pleased him. But he was utterly committed. And he became an abstract artist in part after having visited the studio of Piet Mondrian, the Dutch abstract artist. And that must have been a very moving experience for Calder to see the kind of commitment there was in this artist who was making non-objective abstract art. And so I think it was partly that commitment, but he definitely knew he was making art and making very serious Does art. Does that mean Mondrian had a decided influence on him? I think so. I mean, in part, the palette right. of the primary colors in black and white um, from Mondrian. And we know very little of what actually transpired there. Um, in but terms of the conversation, in, in terms, terms of, of the, the conversation, event. I mean, Calder told us, I mean, many years later, what was actually said. And um, Calder was taken with the colored rectangles that Mondrian had on his studio walls. And Calder said, interestingly enough, he said, isn't it a shame they can't move? <laughs> so that he's seeing these static objects and wanting to see them, as he said, oscillate. And Mondrian said to him, it's not necessary, my painting is already very fast. But Mondrian was a, a highly theoretical and at the same time intuitive artist, and they must have had a wonderful conversation. You think about the kinds of things they could have talked about, of dynamic equilibrium and balance through asymmetry and issues that were important to Mondrian that certainly Calder was very interested in as well. Back to Stabils, here it is, roll tape. Now in his late 40s, Calder began to realize his dream of making ever larger works. Punning on Duchamp's pun, mobile, Jean Alp had dubbed Calder's non-moving sculptures, Stabils. Nothing like these immense abstract monuments of bolted steel had ever been seen before. The progression in his life, you know, from the 30s to the 40s, how did he evolve as an artist? Well, in part, the work got bigger. It got more um, ambitious in terms of uh, scale and material. He began to receive commissions, and he began to make work for the outdoors. And that, as I said, began to happen in the right. late 1950s. And so from then on, there was really a new career with these public it, commissions. And, but he was motivated to do that because it just, you know, the evolution of an artist is to think bigger, larger ambition, bigger canvas, or because somehow outdoors, the elements, what? Well, he actually made sculpture for the outdoors very early on after becoming an abstract artist, and we have some of those early examples in the show. But I think it was particularly the post-war building boom in this country um, in the, the 1950s and on into the 60s with international style buildings that needed, that had grand plazas, urban spaces. And Calder was always regarded as a very friendly monumental artist. And his red stabiles and black stabiles were the perfect kind of curvilinear antidote in a way to the rectilinear forms of these new buildings. Brendan Gill calls him a savior of, of uh, urban renewal. These boxes, these concrete boxes that you had to put a it's beautiful there, calder in the, to soften it. Uh, let me just talk briefly about these slides. Sandy? That's called Black Beast. It's from 1940. It's one of the very earliest uh, stabiles uh, as we know them today. He really intended that piece that could be any size. Yeah. Um, and it's about what, nine feet high or something like that. It's normally in storage. It hasn't been seen for the last 50 years. Why? Um, no one's requested it to be shown. And uh, um, the family has just had it, and no curator came along and said, I want to see that. Yeah, I find that stunning. It is remarkable that there are as many things in our show that have not been seen or have not been seen since MoMA did its great retrospective in 1943. And so we feel that even though this artist is very well known to most people, many of them know the later works and not these remarkable early things. Uh, this? That is a constellation 
um, from the early 1940s when Calder was working mostly in wood because metal was scarce during the war. And he made these marvelous hand-carved wooden objects and then placed them together on different colored metal rods and created this amazing open network of form, which he said was a new type of sculpture. All right. Uh, the next excerpt from the movie is some of the Josephine Baker sculpture which we referred to earlier where Josephine Baker was the star of Paris at the time and he took wire and made art. Here it is. He was a very good dancer, but a very rough dancer. You were apt to be thrown on the floor if you weren't careful. This is an outtake from a Herbert Motter film, which yeah. just came that Sandy gave me lots of piles of 16 millimeter film. Did that you were, know what you were giving? You'd seen it all? Or yeah, I've yeah. been through it. But it had been adhesive taped together, and we re spliced it and said, my gosh, look at this. And there's quite a few things that no one's ever seen. What do you like most from this exhibit as the curator? Um, well, it was a special challenge to deal with kinetic objects, and, mm -hmm. and that was the, the greatest delight and surprise, because a static um, calder, when it's in a case, when it's in a crate, and it comes in and flat, and it's lifeless, and then you watch it take wing, yeah. as our art handlers would take these things out and hang them, and sometimes it would take seven people to hold on. It was right. like choreography. And that sense of discovery of these works was magical, absolutely enchanting. And I think that's the effect of the show. He was working all the time. I mean, the output was prodigious. Every day. He worked every day. Seven days a week? Yeah. In the, in the studio? Yeah, he'd get up, he'd have his hard-boiled egg, he'd go to work. And then he'd uh, be working in the studio, he'd have lunch, go back to the studio and have dinner every day. Yeah. What's the most interesting thing about the film for you? What, other than filming the kinetic energy that you can do which was fantastic well as, well and, as and difficult because it would never do what you wanted to do you yeah. would look through the camera say okay yes and then say roll camera and it wouldn't do that so you'd have to chase it around I think the most interesting thing is is to find out about this man that I really didn't know about that I thought that I knew and I think that's a comment that I keep find getting. out what find out that he invented the mobile that it did not exist before him that uh, that it didn't come from ancient Rome or ancient Greece and every childhood you know child's crib it comes from that uh, he kept pushing his form and never stopped from what from single line drawing to wire sculpture to the mobiles this is Sandy? that's the international mobile from 1949 yeah. and there he's installing it in Philadelphia and that took um, let's see, five men on hydraulic lifts in the National Gallery, about five hours <laughs> to put together, and then we had it hanging, and Sandy, who was late that day, came in and said, wrong, wrong. you've got it put together wrong, so <laughs> up they went back on their hydraulic lifts. Never to let you come back. <laughs> because he, he had both the documents, he had drawings, yeah. but he also knows these things, like the back of his hand. And so we had to reverse the elements, and voila, it all seemed to now, flow what was more the last show you did before this, you? Willem de Kooning. That's right, I thought, de Kooning. Mm -hmm. So this is a long way from de Kooning. And what's next? Um, right now we're working on a sculpture garden for the yeah. National Gallery. So again, three dimensions. <laughs> we're opening a whole new garden next year outdoors. And you just did a, a, a monumental book that's soon going to be out, which is what? The History of Modern Art. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just that, huh? In your spare time, right. I'll just write right. The History of Modern Art. Roll tape, we will see some of the larger works, Alexander Calder, on exhibition, not all of these, on exhibition at the National Gallery in Washington until September, at which time it goes to San Francisco. Roll tape. For the Italian hill town of Spoleto and its festival of the arts in 1962, he made his biggest stabile yet, Teo di Lapio, 60 feet high. For the Expo 67 World's Fair in Montreal, he made a stabile titled Man that was seven stories high. In a way, Alexander Calder had taken on the role of his father and grandfather, acclaimed author of big, grand, crowd-pleasing public statuary. But these were a very different kind of statue.
who's doing this kind of work today? Well, no one is doing this kind of work because you can't make a mobile and have it be much of anything but a ripoff of Calder. Yeah, exactly. It's so very that's... hard to emulate Calder, right. although he has had some followers. Uh, there's a wonderful artist named George Rickey who introduced kineticism in a very different way, but I think is part of Calder's legacy. But in a way, I see Calder's legacy much broader. Um, and the whole notion that we have, that we accept, that contemporary art can exist as performance art, like the circus, as art that is temporal, um, that involves theatricality, movement, video, all the kinds of wildly expansive aspects of contemporary art that have become sort of everyday to us now, I think Calder in part contributed to. You hoped that people who go to the National Gallery will get what out of the experience? Well, it's, it's a wonderfully popular show. I mean, what's, what's fantastic so is... So don't show up at the National Gallery because you can't get in. No, you can get in. It's, it's free. It's you can get in. Gallery. No Easy admission charge. Yeah, but but. Um, it's both just popular for, no one, for people who have never heard of Calder and don't even know the work, um, but also for people, for curators and critics and scholars who think they know the work. Here's an opportunity to see it really in depth um, with a focus on the 30s and 40s, which we think is his, the greatest periods for his contribution in terms of his contribution to 20th century art. Uh, it really has that focus, and I think it's, I think it's really successful in that way. Uh, this is something you ought to do, boys and girls. Uh, this is an extraordinary exhibit put together um, by Marla Prather. This is a book by Asanya Roar, Calder Sculpture, which includes a lot of the, uh, of the things that we've been talking about. You can get a sense of, of how extraordinary uh, his genius was and how towering the ambition was. Uh, when you go down to the National Gallery, even if you don't go, there is this book cataloged by Marla. Uh, Arnaud Pierre uh, wrote an essay and there's some additional contribution by you. In the meantime, uh, what you just saw this evening on this program uh, was just a small, small segment of an extraordinary American Masterpiece uh, episode, which will be on again next Wednesday, at the, se the 17th. On PBS. You ought to go see that. Because you ought to watch that and make that appointment television because... Um, Great art is what uh, keeps us inspired about this life that we are living. I made a notion that it was going to be at the National Gallery until September. As Prather quickly uh, corrected me, it ends July 12, 1998, and then it opens in San Francisco from September 4th to December 1st, 1998. My thanks to you. My thanks to Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Stay with us.